Antonio Gomez, the Dynamics GP Blobster here. Today I actually have an interesting scenario where we need to take some timesheet records from a SharePoint list and transfer those to an Azure SQL database. Now, the one thing about this exercise is the timesheet application is a result of actually converting the expense template app that is provided with Power Apps. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, not focus so much on it, but the end result is when timesheets are approved, we actually want to remove, uh, take those records and remove them from the SharePoint list and put them into Azure SQL. But in the process, I'm going to show you how to verify that those records get transferred over and before we remove them from SharePoint. So stay tuned and let's see how it's done. Okay, so here I have the timesheet template that I created. And this timesheet template is actually based on the expense application that is already available in Power Apps. So if you go to Power Apps and you actually go to Apps or when you're gonna create a new app, you can actually select or view all templates and that template list will contain the expense application. So my expenses, and as you can see here, this one says my timesheet. So all I've done is I've actually transformed and uh, repurposed this expense application into a timesheet application. And you know, if you want more details on the expense application, I'm gonna put a link below to a great video that was created by my good friend and fellow MVP, Reza Dorani. And he will show you in detail how you can actually leverage the expense application, but I don't want to spend my time there. I actually want to show you what I did. So a couple things here is if you run this, it has the same set of design principles that the expense application has because obviously it's based on the expense application. So if I click here and set up a new timesheet, this one in turn automatically defaults the report title, but that's something that you can set up according to your particular needs. But here, I'm gonna actually send, set up myself as an approver of my own timesheet. Yep, not something that you would do in practical life, but something that you definitely can, can think about on how to leverage, uh, for example, the user info, the Office 365 user info connector to actually get the persons manager. Now, the other thing here is I'm gonna select a call center and my particular call center is professional services. So I'm gonna hit create. And again, this sets up a timesheet header. And uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna quickly add a new line. And for today, we're gonna select the category. And that's basically gonna be, let's say consulting. I'm, I'm gonna actually use a custom development project. Let's say that's a custom development project 978. So whatever that is, you know, that's kind of what we're using. Now, the other thing here is we've actually extended this timesheet application to cover our support team. And what they can do is they can actually be working on a case and start the support timer that will accumulate the time for them. And simply when they're done, when they stop the timer, it will automatically set the time for them in the time field. But I'm gonna go and manually set that off to five, uh, two hours and I'm gonna hit save a new line here. Well, actually just save. So let's say we have a timesheet with one line. That's all we need for now. Okay. The idea here then is when I hit submit, I'm going to receive a request for approval of this timesheet. And that request for approval is going to come directly into my email. So I'm just going to open this here and I'm going to hit send and receive just to update inbox and we'll see if we get the notification. Okay. So here's the email notification. And the idea then is when I click approve, uh, before I even do that, actually, I'm going to go back and refresh my timesheet. And this is a little prompt too, but you can, you can get the idea. When I um, refresh this timesheet application, I'm just going to call reload here. So let me just go back here to apps and timesheet. In fact, I shouldn't have actually clicked on the refresh button. But here you can see now that I have a timesheet that is pending approval. And if I actually want to show see my pending timesheets, I can just click here. So the same functionality provided again by the expense application is transferred over to the timesheet application. Now, basically when I hit approve in my inbox, right, I can then provide a reason for approval. But for now, I can also link to the Power BI application that we have. So that basically gives me a list of, uh, you know, overall timesheets that I need to approve. 
So uh, that's in essence one of the features that we implemented here. Again, it's not full full screen, but I'm gonna um, full screen it so you can see what I'm talking about here. And I can see anything that I have to approve myself, and that will give me a list of timesheets that are pending for approval. So that's kind of good in here. It was nice to integrate that with Power BI. That is available to the approvers within our organization. So I'm just going to go ahead and click approve. Let's say I'm satisfied with this particular timesheet. Uh, the next thing that then is going to happen is that timesheet is going to get pushed over by Flow into our Azure SQL database. So right now we have a flow that actually transfers the information out of uh, SharePoint into Azure SQL. So if I just go ahead and refresh the runs here, you will see that I have a, the latest entry here and I'm just going to click on that and that should show you that this flow runs successfully and this is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to see how we can transfer items out of SharePoint into Azure SQL without having to do it manually, which is what most people would resort to when they are not aware of this type of functionality or these type of features in Microsoft Flow. So just to come, come back here, I'm going to click on execute on these two. And then you'll see that um, this basically transferred all the information that I had in that particular uh, SharePoint list into my detail and header tables. Uh, and these are temporary detail header tables. We have a set of other processes that we execute on that data prior to even um, getting additional information to it. So, or moving it into full, full production. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna actually uh, maximize this window and I'm just gonna go here and click edit. So a couple things about transferring items out of SharePoint into SQL when some action occurs. Um, obviously, the first thing that we got to do is we got to identify the site and the list name that we want to target. So in our case, all these timesheets are stored in our expenses list name. And I know we did not change the actual source data name. In this case, this particular list is still called expenses. but the concept and the content is still the same and applicable to timesheets. The first thing that we did was, and this is more for your benefit, because really I can explain a different method for targeting um, this condition that will then allow you to just trigger this when this condition is true. But for all intents and purposes, stay with me right now. And let's just say we added a condition to this step that will allow us to then evaluate the value the status value and make sure that that is equal to approved okay so when we actually approve a timesheet we want this flow to transfer the records out from sharepoint into sql obviously if it's approved this condition will take the yes path and then the first thing we want to add to this is the insert row action now this becomes basically a mapping exercise, right? So the first thing you got to be aware of is obviously identifying your connection. So here, this part targets our database on Azure SQL. And what we've had here then is we actually set the server name to the exact name that is being used on the connection, the database name to the database name used by the connection, and the particular table that we want to target. The rest then becomes a mapping exercise. But there are some things that you got to be aware of. For example, I had to use an expression here for the actual uh, substring and um, or the actual approver name, because what we wanted to do is we wanted to obtain just up to the length of characters that is supported by the actual column that is mapped to, in this case, the approver name column in the temp header table. Now, this is actually very interesting because if you kind of imagine how SharePoint stores data, it sort of pads the um, rest of the string with empty characters when you define a column length. So what we want to do is we want to actually substring this up to the length of the display name of the approver in this case. Now, what that does is it basically eliminates all the extra blank characters and it fits nicely within the column definition. So that's one thing. 
Uh, the second thing is uh, date formatting. So pretty much one of the things that you got to be aware of is you got to define your date format. Keep in mind that SQL Server stores dates slightly different from SharePoint. So you got to make sure that the date definition and the storage matches exactly what's in SharePoint. So we use the format date function here. And what we're doing is we're targeting the output of the trigger to basically retrieve the date submitted. And then we format that in year, month, and day format. And that's pretty much it for that. And then uh, the other thing that you can see here is we do the same thing for the format date and the uh, substring. So I basically know that this has actually been run successfully. So it means that all the mappings are working correctly and all these things. So uh, that's actually very good, very good to know. Now, the next thing is uh, this actually works very nicely for the header part. So we actually inserted the header values. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to get the details. So those are the line items of the timesheet. So it, equally, we're going to use the get items action. And this get items action, what it does is it points directly to the site that hosts the list, in this case, the line items list. And that particular action also makes sure that we retrieve just the corresponding reports that make part of the, um, that equal to the ID that was passed on from the header. So if I go over here and I go to that SharePoint list and you actually go through the line items, you'll see that each line item has a lookup column for the report ID. Well, that lookup column corresponds to the actual ID that is in this list. So that is a good way to visualize it, to explain it. So we actually are retrieving the report IDs that are corresponding to the ID that was passed in in, uh, in that part trigger action. What we can do then is we can take each row retrieved and we then call the insert row action, SQL Server action. And again, we map the values out based on the content of that particular list. So we do that in a apply to each action. So we can basically apply uh, this insert across each one of the values that is being retrieved. So a timesheet can have several line items. We want to make sure we cover all the line items for that timesheet. One of the things that I normally like to do is, uh, and this is just part of my best practices. I want to make sure that before I eliminate any row from my source data, in this case, this, the SharePoint list, I want to make sure that effectively those rows got inserted into the destination. So I actually do a get row. And again, the table that I'm targeting is the temp detail table. And I actually retrieve the query uh, where report ID equals the ID that was passed in initially. So that basically equates to, um, very fine that effectively all those rows were inserted. So then in my compose statement, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make sure that the length of the body of the get rows equal to the actual uh, value that was passed in. So if I inserted more than three rows, then we're more than uh, zero rows, then we're good because I know that the values that was were passed over or inserted into the destination are effectively there. So that's a good way. You can actually do a formula where you compare it directly to the number of records that were retrieved from the lines in SharePoint, but that's entirely up to you. I just want to make sure that effectively there's something in there in the detail for the rows that were inserted. Then the final thing that we do is we, we do an apply to each to remove the detail records. And this is actually the delete records action in the SharePoint connector where we actually pass in the timesheet, the line item, and the ID, and then we just remove those records from, from that list. So once we're done with this, once we're done removing the details, what we do is we remove the actual header. Now, um, this ID corresponds actually to the ID of the records that were retrieved initially from the list. So this actually shows the reusability of the different action elements that are retrieved from previous actions. You can reuse those in subsequent actions. So that's one of the benefits of actually the Power Automate platform and the usability and reusability of action outputs into actions further down the row. 
And then as a last resort, what I do is I send a mobile notification, just letting my user know that the timesheet was uh, successfully transferred to the SQL database. So that in essence is a quick way of constructing a good handling and a good uh, management of the approved timesheets in SharePoint. Just hand them off to our Azure SQL database to make sure we can do photo reporting. And then we actually clear those records out, out of our SharePoint because we only use that for temporary hosting and approval of those uh, timesheet records. And then the next thing that we wanna highlight here quickly is if I go back to the app, you will see that now um, I don't have any other timesheets in here, but you know, it's a good element to see how this continues to work. So I'm just gonna again, enter a new timesheet, then I'm gonna just set myself on the, as an approver to give you a few ideas of what we did. And um, the call center is gonna be professional services Then I'm gonna hit create here. And what I wanna do is I wanna add a new line item. And a couple things that we did here was in the uh, you know categories, we actually extended those or customized them for our own needs. Uh, those are actually stored uh, separately as well. So the activity here is, you know, whatever activity I did, in this case, it could have been a customer support. Then we actually enter the case number, the time. This is actually one of, one of the cool features that uh, we implemented. So I want to show you how that works. Obviously, you know, I don't have the, the time to sit here for all this will take to effectually be um, recorded. But if we stop this, this would have been populated in here and converted to some actual time that you could enter. Let's say at the end of the day, it's one hour and 1.3 hours. That would have been converted automatically, but 14 seconds is almost zero. So that's how that works. The other thing that I wanna uh, bring to light here as well is if I hit save, this can actually allow me to go back and edit any details on this timesheet. So I can add more lines from here. I can delete this report. So this pretty much becomes a very um, useful element that we can, that we in particular here have been able to implement based on an actual existing template and just transform it slightly differently for our particular needs. So with that, I want to say thank you for watching and see you soon.